talk about agile software development from the perspective of the product owner. Here's Pat. She's a product owner. She has a product vision that she's really passionate about. She doesn't know the details of what her product is going to do, but she knows why we're building the product, and what problem it's going to solve, and for who. She talks about it all the time. Here are the stakeholders. They're the people who are going to use and support or in any way be affected by the system being developed. Pat's vision is that these people here will love our system and use it all the time and tell their friends about it. The stakeholder needs and, and Pat's ideas are expressed as user stories here. For example, if this was a flight booking system, people need to be able to search for a flight and maybe that would be one user story. Both Pat and the stakeholders have lots of ideas, so Pat helps turn these into concrete user stories. Now, somebody has to actually build a system. So here they are, a small, co-located, cross-functional, self-organizing development team. Since this is an agile team, they don't save up for a big bang release at the end. Instead, they release early and often. In this case, they usually release about four to six stories per week. So that is their capacity. Capacity is easy to measure. Just count the number of stories released per week. Some stories are big, so they count as two. Some are small and count as a half, but all in all, it adds up to about four to six stories per week. Some people call these story points, but I'm just gonna call them stories per week. In order to maintain this pace and not get bogged down by manual regression testing, the team invests heavily in automated testing and continuous integration. So every story has at least one automated acceptance test at the feature level, and most of the code has automated unit tests. The problem is, here are a bunch of stakeholders asking for all kinds of stuff, and they sure aren't going to be limited to four to six ideas per week. They have lots of ideas and lots of wishes. And every time we deliver something to them, they'll get even more ideas and ask for even more stuff. So what happens if we try to please them, try to do everything they ask for? We'll get overflow. Suppose the team starts working on 10 new stories per week. If the input is 10 and the output is four to six, the team will get overloaded. That will cause multitasking, demotivation, and all kinds of bad stuff. And ultimately it'll lower output and lower quality. It's a lose-lose proposition. It's kind of like trying to shove more paper into a printer to make it print faster, or shoving more cars onto an already crammed highway system. It just doesn't work. It just makes things worse. So what do we do about this? Well, the Scrum and XP way of avoiding this problem is called yesterday's weather. The team says, well, the past few weeks, we've finished four to six features per week. So which four to six features shall we build this week? And the product owner's job is to figure out out of all possible stories in the whole universe, which four to six stories shall we deliver next? The Kanban way is to limit work in progress, or limit WIP, W-I-P. Suppose the team decides that five is the optimal number of stories to be worked on simultaneously. They've learned that that's just enough to keep everybody busy without causing overload. So they decide that five is their WIP limit. Whenever they finish one story, they'll accept one new story, thereby making sure that they never break the limit of five ongoing stories. Both of these approaches work fine, in the sense that the team will have just enough work to do and they'll be able to work fast and effectively. A side effect though is that there will be a queue forming in front of the team, and that queue in Scrum is called a product backlog. The queue needs to be managed. Suppose stakeholders keep asking for 10 new stories every week, and the teams deliver four to six stories every week. That means the queue will just keep getting longer and longer, right? So before you know it, you have a six month long wish list in the backlog and growing. That means that on average, Every story that the team delivers is something that somebody asked for six months ago. How agile is that? So there's really only one way to stop the queue from getting out of control, and that word is no. It is the most important word for product owner, and Pat practices it every day in front of the mirror. Saying yes to a new feature request is easy, especially if it only means adding it to an ever-growing backlog. The most important job for product owner is to decide what not to build and take the consequences of that decision. And that's why it's hard, of course. The product owner decides what goes in and what goes out. The product owner also decides the sequencing. What do we build now? What do we build later? And how long does this list actually need to be? That is a hard job, so Pat doesn't do it alone. She does it in collaboration with the team and the stakeholders. To be able to prioritize, the product owner must have some idea of the value of each story, as well as the size. Some stories are critically important, and others are just bonus features. Some stories take just a few hours to build and others take months. Now, guess what the correlation is between story value and story size? That's right, none. Bigger doesn't mean better. Think of any system that you've used and I bet you can think of at least one really simple feature that is very important that you use every day. And I bet you can think of at least one huge complicated feature that is totally unimportant. Value and size is what helps Pat prioritize intelligently. Like here, these two stories are roughly the same size but of different value. 
So we'll build this one first. And over here, these two stories have roughly the same value, but different size. So we'll build this one first, and so on. Okay, that sounds easy enough, but wait a sec. How does she know the value of a story? And how does she know the size? Well, here's the bad news. She doesn't. It's a guessing game. And it's a game that everyone is involved in. Pat continuously talks to stakeholders to find out what they value. And she continuously talks to the team to find out what they think is big or small in terms of implementation effort. These are relative guesses, not absolute numbers. I don't know what this apple weighs or that strawberry, but I'm pretty sure that the apple weighs at least five times as much and that the strawberry tastes better, to me at least. And that's all Pat needs to know in order to prioritize the backlog. It's pretty cool that way. At the beginning of a new project, our guesses will inevitably suck. But that's okay, the biggest value is really in the conversations rather than in the actual numbers. And every time the team delivers something to real users, we learn something and get better at guessing both value and size. That's why we continuously prioritize and estimate. Trying to get it all right from the beginning is pretty dumb because that's when we know the least. So the feedback loop is our friend. Prioritization is not enough though. In order to deliver early and often, we need to break the stories down into bite-sized pieces, preferably just a few days of work per story. We want this nice funnel shape with small clear stories at the front and more vague stories at the back. By doing this breakdown in a just-in-time fashion, we can take advantage of our latest insights about the product and user needs. All this stuff I've been talking about, estimating the value and size of stories, prioritizing, splitting, all that is usually called backlog grooming. Pat runs a backlog grooming workshop every Wednesday from 11 to 12, one hour per week. The whole team is usually there and sometimes a few stakeholders as well. The agenda varies a bit, but sometimes it focuses on estimation, sometimes on splitting stories, and sometimes on writing acceptance criteria for a story, etc. So I hope you're noticing the theme here, communication. Product ownership is really all about communication. When I ask experienced product owners what it takes to succeed, they usually emphasize passion and communication. So it's no coincidence that the first principle of the Agile Manifesto is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So the product owner's job is not to spoon feed the team with stories. That's boring and ineffective. Pat instead makes sure everybody understands the vision that the team is in direct contact with stakeholders and that there is a short feedback loop in terms of frequent deliveries to real users. That way the team learns and can make daily trade-off decisions on their own so Pat can focus on the big picture. Let's take a look at a few of the trade-offs that need to be made by Pat and the team. First of all, there's a trade-off between different types of value. Early on in a project, uncertainty and risk is our enemy. There's business risk. Are we building the right thing? There's social risk. Can these people build it? And there's technical risk. Will it work on the platform that we want to run it on? Will it scale? And there's cost and schedule risk. Can we finish the product in a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable amount of money? Knowledge can be seen as the opposite of risk. So when uncertainty is high, our focus is knowledge acquisition. We focus on things like user interface prototypes and technical spikes or experiments. Maybe not too exciting for the customers, but still valuable because we are reducing risk. From a customer value perspective, the curve looks like this in the beginning. As uncertainty is reduced, we gradually focus more and more on customer value. We know what we're going to build and how, so just do it. And by doing the highest value stories first, we get this nice steep value curve. And then gradually the value curve starts flattening out. We've built the most important stuff, and now we're just adding the bonus features, the, the toppings on the ice cream. This is a nice place to be because at any point, Pat and the team may decide to trim the tail, to cut right here, and move on to another more important project or maybe start on a whole new feature area within the same product. That is business agility. So when I talk about value here, I actually mean knowledge value plus customer value. And we need to continuously find a trade-off between these two. Another trade-off is short-term versus long-term thinking. What should we build next? Should we do that urgent bug fix? Or build that awesome new feature that will blow the users away? Or do that difficult platform upgrade that will enable faster development in the future sometime. We need to continuously balance between reactive work and proactive work, or firefighting and fire prevention. And this relates to another trade-off. Should we focus on building the right thing, or building the thing right, or perhaps building it fast? Ideally, we want all three, but it's hard to find the balance. Suppose we are here, trying to build the perfect product with the perfect architecture. If we spend too much time trying to get it perfect, we may miss the market window or run into cash flow problems. Or suppose we are here, rushing to turn a prototype into a usable product. Great for the short term, perhaps, 
but in the long term, we might be drowning in technical debt and our velocity will approach zero. Or suppose we are here, building a beautiful cathedral in record time, except that the users didn't need a cathedral, they needed a camper van. So there's a healthy tension here between the scrum rules. Product owners tend to focus on building the right thing. Development teams tend to focus on building the thing right. And scrum masters or agile coaches tend to focus on shortening the feedback loop. Speed is actually worth emphasizing because a short feedback loop will accelerate learning. So you'll more quickly learn what the right thing is and how to build it right. However, all three perspectives are important. So keep trying to find the balance. Finally, there is a trade-off between new product development and old product improvement. Product backlog is actually a slightly confusing term because it implies that there is only one product. And project is a confusing term too because it implies that product development ends. A product is never really finished. There's always maintenance and improvements to be done all the way until the product reaches end of life and is shut down. So when a team starts developing a new product, what happens to their last one? Handing off a product from one team to another is expensive or risky. So a more common scenario is that the team continues maintaining the old product while developing the new one. So it's not really a product backlog anymore, it's more like a team backlog, a list of stuff that the product owner wants this team to build. And it can be a mix of stuff from different products. And the product owner needs to continuously make trade-offs between these. Once in a while, a stakeholder will call Pat and say, hey, when will my stuff be done? Or how much of my stuff will be done by Christmas? As product owner, Pat is responsible for expectations management, or more importantly, realistic expectations management. And that means no lying. I know it's tough, but who said Agile was easy? It's not really that hard to make a forecast as long as it doesn't have to be exact. If you measure the velocity of your team or the combined velocity of all your teams, you can draw a story burnup chart like this. This chart shows the cumulative number of stories delivered over time, or story points if you prefer. Note the difference. This curve shows output. That curve shows outcome. That's the output, and that's the outcome that we hope it will achieve. Our goal is not to produce as much output as possible. Our goal is to reach the desired outcome, happy stakeholders, using the least possible output. Less is more. Now look at the burn-up chart and you can draw an optimistic and pessimistic trend line. You can do it using fancy statistics voodoo, or you can just draw it visually. And the gap between these lines is of course related to how wavy and unpredictable your velocity is. Luckily that tends to stabilize over time, so our cone of uncertainty should get tighter and tighter. Okay, so back to expectations management. Suppose the stakeholders ask Pat, when will all of this stuff be done? When will we be here? That's a fixed scope, variable time question. So Pat uses the two trend lines to answer. Most likely sometime between April and mid-May. Suppose the stakeholders ask Pat, how much will be done by Christmas? That's a fixed time variable scope question. The trend lines tell us, oh, we'll most likely finish all of these by Christmas, some of those and none of those. And finally, suppose the stakeholders say, can we get these features by Christmas? Now that's a fixed time, fixed scope question. Looking at trend lines, Pat says, nope, sorry, ain't gonna happen. Followed by, here's how much we can get done by Christmas, or here's how much more time we would need to get everything done. It's generally better to reduce scope than to extend time, because if we reduce scope first, we still have the option to extend the time later and add the rest of the stories. Vice versa doesn't work, because darn it, we can't turn the clock backwards. You know, time is rather annoying that way, isn't it? So Pat puts it this way. We could deliver something here and the rest later, or we could deliver nothing here and the rest later. Which do you prefer? These calculations are pretty simple to do, so Pat updates the forecast every week. The important thing here is that we are using real data to make the forecast, and that we are being honest about uncertainty. I said no lying, right? So this is a very honest way of communicating with stakeholders, and they usually appreciate that a lot. If your organization doesn't like truth and honesty, it probably won't like Agile. Now, a word of warning. If the team is accumulating technical debt, if they're not writing tests and not continuously improving the architecture, then they will get slower and slower over time, and the story burnup curve will gradually flatten out. That makes forecasting almost impossible for Pat. So the team is responsible for maintaining a sustainable pace, and Pat avoids pressuring them into taking shortcuts. Okay, what if we have a larger project with multiple teams? and we have several product owners, each with their own backlog for a different part of the product. Overall, the model is really the same. We still need capacity management. We still need stakeholder communication. We still need product owners who can say no. We still need backlog grooming. 
We still need a short feedback loop, etc. Velocity is really the sum of all output, so that can be used for forecasting. Or make a separate forecast for each team, if that makes more sense. In a multiple team scenario, however, the product owners have an important additional responsibility to talk to each other. We should organize the teams and backlogs to minimize dependencies, but there will always be some dependencies that we just can't get rid of. So there needs to be some kind of sync between the product owners so that, so that they build things in a sensible order and avoid sub-optimizing. In large projects, this usually calls for some kind of chief product owner role to keep the product owners synchronized. Okay, that's it. Agile product ownership in a nutshell. Hope this was useful to you. Mm -hmm.